A great evil was born on the 6th of November 1956, known for the deaths of four underage girls. He has forever changed the Kingdom of Belgium. The dysfunctional family Dutroux moved to Belgian Congo soon after Mark was born, but would move back after less than four years of living there, because his father was fighting with most of the people he knew in the country. He was fighting with the board of the school he worked at, with the members of the political party he joined. The one takeaway of all these fights was, it was never his fault, he always shifted the blame to others. After moving back, he started fighting with the people at the new school he worked at, receiving multiple suspensions, until the city council forced him to retire when he was 43, and he would spend the rest of his life convinced he was a victim of the injustices of the system and society. This is the exact way of thinking his son would adapt and evolve, to always reason his way out of taking responsibility, even if his reasonings rarely made sense, he for one was always convinced he was right. Mark went to four different schools to finish primary school, and would drop out of the third high school he went to after five years. All teachers that taught him called him an unruly and abhorrent student, who always created problems, only finishing up to the third year. He earned an A3 mechanics degree, with the fighting between his parents becoming worse, it would fall for divorce. His mom quickly got a new boyfriend who was only 18, a year older than her son, with whom Mark would often fight. Because of this he moved out. He worked a bunch of jobs over the years, which he would quit soon after when they became boring, deciding to never seek another job again. The first problems would arise. After he met his first wife on the ice skating rink, the 21-year-old Mark took a liking to the 16-year-old Francois. He got her to fall in love with him, and she would get pregnant soon after, which would mark the end of their happy days. Mark turned into an aggressive tyrant, who always demanded his way, physically abusing his wife if she went against him. He also lost interest in her, often going to nightclubs and the rink to cheat on her. He even had a fine piece of Dutro logic to explain it. His affairs are actually his wife's fault for not being able to keep up with him intellectually. She stagnated in their marriage while he kept evolving. This relationship wouldn't last. One day he would reveal the existence of one of his lovers, Michel Martin, in the hopes they could form a family together. His wife refused and after she found him in their bed, she took the kids and left. Mark didn't mind, however. He had part custody over the kids, which meant more money to supplement his unemployment benefits, and he got to live together with Martin. Although this relationship wouldn't be a happy one either, as her life would be wholly controlled soon after they moved in together, and once again after she got pregnant, he became aggressive and started to lose interest in her. While out on a scrap ceiling run, he met up with an old acquaintance, Patrice Chavonnier, and after reconnecting, they decided to rob elderly people together who they knew lived alone thanks to Patrice's job as a middleman. This would be a stepping stone towards the heavier crimes he would make his money from until his eventual arrest. Focusing mainly on stealing cars and selling the parts, but also trying to get into drug dealing and human trafficking. With his illegal activities, he would make enough money to buy seven different houses. In 1985, Mark Dutroux would kidnap and rape five girls in an age range of 11 to 19. Mark never worked alone. Across all of his abductions, he had one or two accomplices, of which at least three have never been identified. They always used crude yet effective methods. The first abduction he committed with Van Petteham. They waited for the victim to exit the pool, after which his accomplice literally just grabbed her and dragged her to their car. On the 17th of October, the 18-year-old XLD got off the bus and was only a short walk from home when she noticed a dirty white van following her. It drove past, dropped someone off and stayed stationary until she passed, after which it pulls up and drives past her again. She starts to become frightened, but before she can act, she's pulled into the van and her eyes are taped shut. Once the van stops, she's brought into a house and made to undress where Mark calls Martin to show off his new prize. They corral her to the bedroom, and she is raped for hours on end, and then again by the other captor. After almost 24 hours, they make her dress herself again, push her back into the van, and drop her off close to home. 
Two months after this horrific crime, the police arrested the suspect, and the 20-year-old von Petterham would not last long under the harsh interrogations. He confesses to all five crimes, and to his sixth one, the first he helped with according to him. It concerned two girls from Morland Wells. The victims of this were never found, and were never included among his crimes. Mark and his wife would be arrested, and the trio would be convicted to six, ten, and two and a half years in prison, where our main suspect would receive an additional three and a half years for other offenses. Mark, of course, pleaded his innocence. He was a victim of the system and all that. The other two did give interesting rationales. Van Petterham stated he was overwhelmed by Mark. He had lived in one of his houses for free, and on the day of his first crime, his fiancée had just passed away. But then stated he had reasoned her into compliance. He had told her he did everything for her. If he had affairs the normal way, it would cost him a lot of time and money, time he isn't spending with his family. And as he's doing this for her, it would make sense she helped out. In prison, a ray of sunshine was insufferable to all around him. He got into fights with other inmates. The guards hated him. The only one he got along with was the chaplain after taking a job cleaning and helping around the chapel. This might have contributed to his premature release in 1992, as the chaplain has a lot of sway in these cases. Right after he was released, his former accomplice would die in an accident after he ran a red light with his moped and was run over by a bus. In 1993, Claude report to the police that a friend of his was building a hidden cellar in his house, in which he planned to store young girls he kidnapped in wait of being sold. Tiro knew this because he was offered a place in this operation. They found the cellar in one of his houses after a search, but building a cellar isn't illegal, and he hadn't committed any crimes. A second search in another house didn't reveal anything either. Mark was desperate to find a new accomplice, and after a couple letdowns he found him. Bernard Weinstein, who helped him with his construction project as well, and soon after, Michel de Lievre. The 24-year-old heroin addict pledged his help in exchange for drugs. It's around 5 p.m. when the 8-year-old Julie and Melissa leaves to take a walk and would never return again. According to a witness, a car pulled up beside them. The door opened and they got in. No force was used. They only made one mistake. They were too young. Mark would later state, Given their age and their physique, it would have been absolutely criminal to want to have a sexual relationship with them already. The dungeon wasn't even finished at this point, so the captives were kept on the first floor and continuously drugged with sleeping and sedative drugs. The chances of them escaping were small. They were convinced their captors were part of a human trafficking ring, which all the neighbors were in on. Mark was their savior who decided to keep them safe instead of selling them. They were taught to hide under the covers in their cell. If they heard even the slightest strange sound, and to not respond to anyone but their protector. The men kept them with one clear goal, to start a real relationship with them once they hit puberty. The two he had were too young, so new ones were needed. So Mark and Michelle set out. They found on an avia who were trying to hitch a ride to the bungalow they were staying. They picked the wrong car. After getting in, they were sedated with Rahipnol and brought back to the house in Marcenel, where they would be raped for a couple days, before Mark decided it was too much effort to have four girls in the house. He drove them to Bernard's hangar and buried them, presumably alive. Although they were so heavily malnourished, the autopsies were inconclusive. The parents of both these girls were constantly on TV, pleading for anyone who knew something to help find their daughters. For a year they kept this up. Disaster would strike after a stolen truck went missing. Mark had planned to make 500,000 Belgian francs. They suspected Pierre Rochot and ended up drugging him, his friend and his girlfriend. They tied up the two men, but left the woman passed out. A fatal mistake. She went straight to the cops while they were robbing Pierre's house and after a month Mark would be arrested and kept for three and a half months, but only Mark, as he had killed Bernard and buried him in his yard close to the girls. On his return, he found the girls emaciated, too weak to even speak. There was food in their cell for only two months, so he had ordered Martin to bring more, even giving her the money required, but she didn't. 
She left some food in the cellar, but it was too far to reach. They could only stare at it as they slowly starved. Mark's attempts to restore them to health failed, and both of them passed away. The 28th of May, 1996. Mark and Michelle are waiting in their mobile home for the target to arrive, the 12-year-old Sabine. Once she passes, they follow her through town, until a small one-way street that was still dimly lit. Mark grabbed her from her bike and threw her on a bed. Michelle then hit the brakes and ran out to grab the bike to hide the evidence. No one saw anything. He would rape her almost every day for 80 long days. Sabine needed a new friend, so the two men once again rode out the procura. A target was spotted and it all happened quickly. Michelle spoke to Leticia from inside a van and Mark dragged her inside. She was sedated, brought to the house and raped. A swift capture which would prove to be his undoing. Four days after the abduction, he was visiting Martin in saint la buchere when a special arrest team charged in to capture him and his wife. After two days of denial, he suddenly said, I intend to tell the truth immediately. I did indeed kidnap little Leticia on Friday. I was indeed in the company of Michel Lelievre when those facts occurred. I am prepared to explain everything in detail. At the moment, the girl is still alive and I am ready to show you where she is. She is in the company of little Sabine, whom I have also kidnapped. Take the keys of Marcinelle, I will show you. Tapes were recovered in his house, which showed the rape of three additional women from Slovakia. One in Topolchani, and two who came with him on holiday. His first visit to the country was in 1994, and he immediately became the talk of the town. This was not long after the wall fell and a rich, successful westerner was of much interest to the residents of the small industrial town. A charmer like Mark was practically a star. It was easy to convince their parents to let them visit one of his many houses in Belgium. He was present in Slovakia at the time of more rapes and was even suspected in a murder case. But there wasn't enough evidence in any of these cases, and he was never convicted. In prison, Mr. Dutro made some amazing statements once again. On the kidnapping of the first two girls, Michel was boasting about how he could get anything, so I challenged him to get me a young girl. I paid him 50,000. One day when I came home, I was surprised to find two girls in my living room. He further confessed Michel and Bernard had captured them together. He was blameless. He only kept them because he had already been convicted and knew what would happen were they discovered. On the 22nd of June 2004, Marc Dutro was sentenced to life in prison for the two murders and six rapes and kidnappings, as well as conspiracy and drug-related charges. Michel Martin was sentenced to 30 years in prison for letting the two girls starve to death and kidnapping, and has since been released under conditions in 2012. Michel Lelievre was sentenced to 25 years in prison for four counts of kidnapping and rape, and has since been released under conditions in 2019. Businessman Michel Nihol was also implicated after Mark claimed his involvement, but after an investigation nothing incriminating was found and was only convicted for fraud and trading in stolen vehicles. The actions of Dutro weren't the only nation-changing event. Many will also know this case for the incredible incompetence of the Belgian police forces and the possible conspiracy surrounding these events. The first error, of course, was letting him go in the first place, but that aside, the first error was ignoring warnings from the people around him, including his mother, who wrote a letter warning of kidnapped girls being held at his house. Error 2. A video was seized after his house was searched in relation to the truck incident that showed him building a cellar there. If it had been reviewed, they might have uncovered the cellar in 1995 and saved the two girls from starvation. But they did not, as the police didn't own anything that could play a tape. The worst error was the house search after his final arrest. They deployed twice as many officers as normal, accompanied by docs and forensic investigators, yet failed to find the secret cellar after a two-hour search. Mark was also able to escape custody for a couple of hours in 98. After he overpowered a police officer, he also received an additional five-year sentence for threatening another officer. For some reason, seems fairly pointless. After this latest display of incompetence, the commander of the gendarmerie resigned, followed by the ministers of justice and internal affairs. A substantial investigation into police functioning was launched, 
which would lead to the merging of the three police organizations into a single entity. More on the conspiracy in part two of the Detroit affair. This was the Lower Sanctum. Have a nice day.